possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTE GA podcast. Mikey Stafford here. It's All Ireland final week. Finally, it's uh, you know we're almost back to a traditional date before we go back to July next year. It's all very discombobulating, but anyway, it's All Ireland football final week, and it's also All Ireland Camogie final week. We'll be previewing both uh, this afternoon, uh, this morning. We'll start with the football. So, Kieran Whelan, Desi Dolan, and Rory O'Neill, all with me. How are we, lads? Very good, very good, good. good. It's tough. That's, it's it's officially football. Final fever has has reached Mayo. Um, I know it doesn't take much for it to reach Mayo, but you have to admit that this is a new level of hysteria. <laughs> Ballina Credit Union are giving out instant five hundred euro Mayo for Sam loans. You don't need any savings history. You can just walk into <laughs> Ballina Credit Union and say, "I need five hundred quid to get to Dublin. Can I have it, please?" And they'll give it to you, bang like that. I'm telling you, that's fantastic. That's be seen bit, an opportunity. They'll be, they'll be busy Monday morning if they win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the loan. This is in the Sunday Business Post or the Business Post. The loan is marketed towards Mayo fans heading to Croke Park this Saturday for the All Ireland Senior Football Championship final between Mayo and Tyrone, one of whom will win. Um, historic. Uh, a Mayo for Sam. Yeah, the loan is for five hundred euros and it requires no saving record and is approved in seconds. That's fantastic. Can you get, isn't it? Can you get the five hundred if you're not going to the messenger? Yeah, can, let's just get, <laughs> hop in the car and go to Ballina. <laughs> 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 so, um, I look, it's great and. Um, we mentioned it briefly last week, Wheelow, on the podcast, but to have a novel pairing, now obviously you have your Dublin allegiances and you want, you'd love Dublin to be going for seven in a row, but for most of us, to have a novel All-Ireland football final pairing, um, it's great. It, it does. It adds a certain freshness uh, at the end of what's been a kind of a difficult couple of years for the GA, doesn't it? Ah, big time, Mikey. Like, listen, it's brilliant. It's, it's brilliant for football, you know. I think if you look back the last few weeks even what the mead miners achieved the off the under 20s achieved like football i think is in a real healthy space and um, probably compared to maybe it was a few years ago when we were we were constantly criticizing it for the boring tactics and it was labored and it was hard in the eye to watch and stuff like that and i think you know it has evolved over the last couple of years and listen you're dead right you know okay dublin Dublin were there the last few years. It'd become predictable. They would have went into the finals probably as favourites most games. We probably thought two years ago when Kerry played them and, and, and nearly clipped them in 2019 that we were seeing the start of an era where the two of them might be kind of dominant for a few years. And nobody probably envisaged the start of the year that we, you know, no one would have picked a Tyrone Mayo final. But do you know what? It's brilliant um, it, it, it because for once you're looking ahead to a final and it's really, really difficult to call. Um, you know, both teams are, are, are in no way perf- perf- have perfected it. They both had kind of blips nearly along the way for periods of games, but they've both shown massive character and resilience uh, to, 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 to particularly to win their semi-finals. And, you know, you, I have to say, when you're looking at this game, you're looking at tactical and you're looking at the strengths and weaknesses of both teams, you're kind of saying, it's very, very hard to actually pick a team that sticks out. Uh, and and, and that, that's what makes it intriguing because there's so much. You know, I, I hope, I really hope we get the final that we that we expect. You know, sometimes when you're expecting the game to go down to the wire, one team kind of maybe just takes control and it can turn out a damn squid. So, but I do, I do think, you know, it's it's a very, very difficult uh, game to call. Both both teams have had a similar journey to the final, but that's brilliant, brilliant for football. Like, I, in fairness, I, I can't wait for it Saturday evening. I think it's going to be, it's going to be intriguing to see and, and come come Saturday night. Well, I don't. Well, there could be a replay. Couldn't there? Is, there, is there extra time? Replay. Extra time first, Wheelo, and then a replay on Sunday the nineteenth. So eight days later. Most likely, we'll have somebody uh, on 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 Saturday evening, and 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 it's going to be fairly. The celebrations will be wild, no matter which direction Sam is going. That, so that five hundred euros wouldn't get you far. <laughs> get you, it'll get you to about Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Desi, I think. What what kind of adds to the novel pairing here is, look, let's like I don't think I'm I'm going to shock anyone here by saying that there's almost a good versus evil element here in the eyes of a lot of GA fans. And I'm this isn't me saying this. This is Una McCaffrey in the Irish Times. She's a a Tyrone fan, and it's Tyrone. It's not Tyrone. She mentions that. Um, 
I'm fairly sure that if you asked a Mongolian herder a few hundred miles outside Ulaanbaatar this week who he would like to win on Saturday, he'd go for the Connacht <laughs> champions. The answer is especially clear this year as they line out against everybody's favourite GA baddies, Tyrone. For us Tyrone fans, there's a familiarity to this, just as Mayo fans must be bored with the time-worn deserving narrative. We know 31 counties plus New York and London and the rest of the universe are against us in our endeavours, but hey... That's okay. They really are the mill wall of the GA ah, world, are, and yeah. they, they they embrace it, which I suppose is the important thing to do. Yeah, they love it. They love it. And they'll be hoovering up tickets. They'll they'll see that there'll be probably there will be more Mayo supporters somehow in the in the Crow Park. They just do it like. But mm. um, the one thing about it initially, I was like sitting back on the Monday after that weekend, and I was like, "Geez, uh, Dublin are gone, Kerry are gone, Mayo are in the final." And I'm thinking, it's absolutely it's in the stars this year. Destiny has arrived for the Mayo. But as the game is coming closer, as it's creeping up to the weekend, I'm going, he's everything that Mayo wouldn't want is in this Tyrone team. They're tough. They're physical. I think they've found a game plan. I was down in, in Killarney in June where the ship six goals and Brian Duher and Fergal Logan are scratching their heads. But I think they were very clever. They were ambitious. They tried out things during the league. They really did. They experimented along. They had a little bit of luck along the way. Their game plan has kind of settled in where they're going to soak up a lot of pressure. They're very physical in the tackle. And the thing that I think is an important thing as well is, like I felt initially with, with the game against Kerry and Tyrone, I thought like in the first couple of minutes I was noticing, just David Coldrick is letting it go a little bit. Like he's letting the tackle happen. He's, he's letting the physicality into the game. So there's big questions on how Joe McQuillan ref the game. I think that's, I think that's really, a huge thing. Huge, yeah. huge factor, yeah. Desi. Be- because... In, after a couple of minutes, I was like, oh, geez, David Coldrick isn't giving them freeze. And I don't know, a lot of refs, maybe seven or eight out refs that might give a freeze for like a, a bit of a pull or a bit of physicality. And it wasn't happening. And you could see the, the fuel was coming into the Tyrone players more and more as that game was going along. They judged the situation. They realized that the referee wasn't blowing the soft freeze. And that physicality is what kind of ultimately turned over the Kerry boys because they just kept going into the wall of traffic. And they weren't getting their freeze, which they probably might have been getting down the Munster Championship. And as a result of that, the Tyrone lads really kind of set out in place. And then the bench was unleashed. You had your Carl McShane, who still looks very rusty, I have to say now. <laughs> but when he runs with the ball, it's just his physicality that he brings. We haven't seen the best of Derek Can- Canavan yet either. We've seen glimpses of his brilliance. But like to be honest, I've seen him in a couple of under-20 Ulster games before maybe Championship games a couple of years ago. He's phenomenal with his hands. He's very creative. Um, and he's very skillful and a great man to bring in. Of course, Tierney McCann came in as well. So, like, Tyrone, a very strong bench. But for me, like, that point about the referee, I think, is, is, is very important. And to see who's going to win it, I think, as well, Tyrone won't score an unbelievable amount, except against Kerry to score three goals. And that three goals, that three goals, again, was critical in them winning that match. Because if they get goals, they have a great chance. I think it's a massive thing for Mayo to keep out the goals. Yeah, something they're not particularly good at. Particularly, you know, I, I do I have it's... to, uh, like, when I, like, you don't want to single out players, but if you think of the, like, the Michael Murphy, Donegal 2012, the high ball, diagonal ball into the full back line, if you think of Kieran Donaghy and Tommy Walsh catching ball and creating and scored the gooch coming off them back of the net. They had think, one in the net last year, last yeah. last Christmas after and I, 13 seconds. And as well, remember Bernard Brogan, a couple of balls were coming in right on top of David Clark and himself. They just flicked it over him into the back of the net. So that full back line. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Mike, that's, the, that's what it said at the start. Um, but Pora Cahora, he's a rough diamond. I don't know if we've seen what he exactly can do or do we have a fully judge, but he's picking up man of the matches at full back. Like he's like, you know, it's, you can't believe this fella is after a parent to be so good. And appears to be so solid in the full back line. And as well as that, now lads, I've seen this Oshin Mullen a couple of times this year um, down in the Connacht Championship at a league match. He's a phenomenal player. We, like, he's only going to get better and better and better. And the if they manage to hold on to him, Desi, the Australians have an offer on the table. And I, that's one thing I'm sure Mayo would be worried about. But Well, I would be worried. He is a Mayo, freak. Yeah. He is an athletic yeah. freak. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, Class. They like an athletic freak down there. I think, Mike, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how Tyrone approached the game because I suppose incrementally over the last year they've kind of gone a little bit more conservative you know after after that day in Killarney and like they set out their stall against Monaghan they have you know they defend from midfield back you know they play with two up top 
you know, they get Conor McKenna comes out deep. They have McGeary and Myler, the midfielders pressing around the middle. They they hold that central channel. They let you down the wings. But once you step in, the you know the Frank Burns is there. The body's back, and and if you give them time to set up, they set up. And they're happy to like the one the one thing even even from uh, you know conceding the kickouts the last day to Kerry. Like they're they're moving all the time back towards maybe the Mickey Hart type of football. Do you know what I mean? Yes, they do want to kick it and they do want to be expansive and stuff like that. But like when you look back at the fact that Kerry turned the ball over 35 times, like that's once, like once every two minutes. Like that's phenomenal. And that's what they fed off. So it's going to be interesting to see. You would expect that Mayo will have learned from Kerry's mistakes. You know, they'll they'll know that, you know, they'll get possession. They'll know, yes, we have to get at them quicker, but also they'll probably know that we have to be a little bit more patient and we're going to have to stretch them a little bit and not get, not walk into the traps a bit. And you wonder, you know, may, and Mayo may or not bad at that. You know, I remember watching them last year against Ross Common and the, you know, they 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 can they can stretch play with width, they can bring it from one side to the other when the game slows down, even against Westmead in the in, in the league this year. Westmead played very defensive mm. against and Desi. And when the play does slow down, they're very, very good at getting the Paddy Durkins and the Al McLaughlins and the Oshin Mullins and these guys co- coming as strike runners and and, and punch and hold. So it's interesting that like if you know, you, Tyrone have kind of set out their style over the last two games and they have a set kind of system. But you got a sense, I, I sense they're going to have to mix it up a bit. Um, you know, if they're, if, and I ask a few questions about Mayo because we said it, we said it, I think in the long, like Mayo didn't uh, concede any goals against Dublin, but up to that, you know, they have been, as you touched on, Daisy, they have been. So I, I think Tyrone will try and get their, their, they have to get their kicking game going. While they're brilliant at their counter attacking and counter attacking with wit. I think they're going to have to mix up their game plan to try to get at Mayo because if they give them that much possession, you know, I think Mayo will utilise it better maybe than like Kerry were off on the leave. Off yeah. the- um, it, given how we, we think we see the game going, Roy, will there be a, a kind of a, a, quite a lot of, you know, moving the ball through the hand, carrying it. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of tackling, obviously. And, you know, the, the, the turnover game is going to be very important. I, so the referee is very important and how he interprets it. I think it's not unfair to say that there'd be, there was a little bit of surprise, perhaps, that yeah. John McQuillan's name when it came up. I'd say, I'd say there was a lot of surprise. I mean, why you would have two counties competing from the provinces of Connacht and Ulster and then appoint an Ulster referee. And that's not to cast any aspersions on Joe. I'm sure Joe will do a very impartial job. But when you've got somebody like David Goff sat in the sidelines, um, who's from Leinster, who is arguably, I mean, the lads might beg to differ, but who's arguably the top ref in the country. I thought it was a not... Yeah, he certainly has his eyes in the back of his head. Basically. Yeah, and, 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 and it's an interesting one because, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, Mikey, about narrative and, you know, the fact that you've got one team kind of trying to remove a spell and then you have another protagonist who are probably concocting some sort of witchcraft and voodoo to try and, you know, <laughs> which is their kind of modus operandi. And it's it's perfectly poised, but it's from a neutral's perspective, it's a bit like a novice chase. If anyone would be familiar with that kind of a horse race, and that it's wildly unpredictable and very very hard to call, and you're just having a clue what's going to happen. So I suppose as some to try and farm some semblance of clue in my head, I was saying this to Willow last night, like that. I just had a look at the 2016, the last time they met in the championship, and. Um, um, and now there's a lot has changed in five years. Of course, there was two different management teams. It was Stephen Rochford in one bench and Mickey Hart, obviously, in the other. But a lot didn't, a lot hasn't changed either. And it was quite striking, actually, how much is still the same, how many of the players are still there, and the styles and the way both teams are playing, how much that has actually still remained the same. But one thing that I thought was very interesting was the officiating, to go back to your original question that day. On one line, you had Coldrick. On the other line, you had Derek O'Mahony, both excellent right, referees in their own right. And in the middle was Goff. And this was a game that was tetchy. It was niggly. There was rose break. There was a massive road right after halftime, which resulted in a yellow card for Lee Keegan and Sean Kavanagh, which ultimately ended up resulting in Sean Kavanagh getting sent off. Ten minutes to go when the game was level. Um, you know, the, there was a lot of off the ball stuff going on, a lot of late hits. 
And this is to go back to Wheelow's point earlier on, where he mentioned how that, you know, we're hoping for this, you know, purer than pure final and that it'll be this great sort of demonstration of football. It may not, but what it might be is just like what we got in both semis, which is a, a, and a battle, a proper Gaelic football, old school battle. And you just hope that McQuillan, I think it's his last year, and I just hope that he's able to ride that line of, you know, allowing us enough go without it spoiling over and trying to be as fair as possible to both teams in his interpretation. Does Fergal Horgan going to be, do football at all, it's, no? It's going to be, it's going, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be very, very difficult for him. And as Vila mentioned there again, you know, like it might be the case at times where you will need eyes to the back of your head because I'd say, like, the chances are, I don't think this, I think this is going to be unbelievably tight, by the way. And I don't see either team flopping in the way that Cork flopped, we'll say, in the hurling final. I don't really see that. I, I, would you, I don't know whether the lads would agree on that. I think it, they might, both teams might not necessarily play to their potential either, but. I do think it's going to be unbelievably tight. It will be an absolute nail biter. I mean, I'm nervous and I don't care who wins or loses. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we love, my, my armchair analysis of this is that um, like, like that Mongolian sheep herder, I would really like to see Bayo win for a variety of reasons. But um, my head is, my, the closer it gets, the closer it gets, my head is saying Tyrone because to me, they demonstrated against Kerry a very clear game plan and they implemented it and sure they rode their luck but they were playing the All-Ireland favourite the favourites for the All-Ireland and they had a bit of luck and they scored three goals to me Mayo's game plan certainly against Dublin was less clear to me it seemed to be soak up as much pos- pressure as possible for 50 minutes and then uh, yeah, hope for chaos and yeah. um, to me Tyrone just seemed like even though the management team is newer and less experienced they just seem a little further down the road almost which is something I didn't think I'd be saying yeah, I think there's something in there, though, in that, Mikey, when you say the chaos. I think when we look at the profile of these teams, we have a tendency to think, you know, Tyrone are psychologically stronger because their track record and they got to finals in the noughties and they they turn up on the big occasion and they're mentally oh. tough and they drag, they can they can win an arm wrestle and they can, if it, if it bring it down to their level, it suits them. And then we look at Mayo and we think, yes, you know, people look at Mayo and say, yeah, the amount of times they've lost, they've cracked under pressure, but... I, I, I think this Mayo team is different. Uh, I think I, I don't buy into that at all because you know they've had significant turnover in terms of some of their players. Uh, I think they've shown remarkable resilience at times this year, particularly you know half time against Galway again going against them, not at the pitch of it. You know came out turned around blitzed them. You know Dublin. I thought I felt at times in the first half they were one point away from collapsing. You know and came out in that second half and. If I was to lean to one thing, what you said, okay, yes, Tyrone have a very structure and they look organised and we kind of know what they, they're going to do. That sometimes coming into a final can be a, a negative as well. And I, I look at one aspect uh, of Mayo's. It, it, we all know how athletic Mayo are. Um, and you feel, yes, if this game goes into the chaos stage, and it all depends on how it's been reft as well and, and mm. how, how the game has flowed and stuff like that. But the one thing that Mayo demonstrated was that they have the athleticism to actually push right up man on man all around the field. And actually, and they show that against Dublin, particularly in that last quarter. And I think if you go back to the Monaghan game, when Monaghan, you know, threw, threw the kitchen sink at Tyrone after being five down at half time, and they came out in the second half and they pushed right up and pressed right out on Tyrone. It caused Tyrone a lot of difficulties. So I, I know... You know, you're saying, did May have a game plan? But I think they came into the Dublin game saying, well, we don't want to concede an early goal. We don't want any sucker punches. We don't want to, you know, and, and I think they, 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 maybe they didn't intend to, but they kind of maybe stood off Dublin a little bit and, and they were getting bodies back onto that D and they didn't want Dublin to, Conor Callan to get in behind them a couple of times and get a couple of goals. And I think, you know, I think... Good to see, we know. A little, little bit of intent in that. And, they, and they, they might have, like, they missed a couple of chances. Look at Aidan O'Shea. Yeah, I was uh, just going to say, like, yeah. it could have been 10-6 or 10-7 at half time. Like, you know? So, in some ways, I, I, I think that, you know, Mayo might have, might have learned it's very, very hard to go with that high press for 70 minutes and really go after teams. And, 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 and I think Porham has done a great job in trying to maybe... Look at where are the where, where where are the key points in the game, and that's third and four quarters. Where do you have to be 
at your best in that chaotic period. And, and I think they've done that quite well. So yeah, it's, 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 that's the interesting dynamic of it, Mikey, you know, mm. that's why I feel Tyrone maybe have to mix it up a bit. The fact that they've set out their stall and the game plan is there. I, 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 I would think if Tyrone do what they've done against Kerry and give Mayo enough possession, Mayo will do enough with it to win the game. And uh, that's why it, I, I think, do they bring in a, do they bring in a Mark Bradley? Do they play with a third man up front? You know what I mean? Like both teams are excellent man markers. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you look at each end of the field and you're comfortable that Hampsey can do a job. You know, Rory Brennan, if he plays, can do a job. McNamee can do a job. You look at the other end of the field and you think about, you have Lee Keegan, you have Paulie Gohara, you have Oshin Mullen, you have Paddy Durkin, you have four or five. So you're, you're going to give a couple of them responsibility for matchups, but you obviously want, want to play them to their strengths as well. So, uh, I wonder will Tyrone maybe mix it up? Will they will they start Bradley? Will they try and go with a little bit more of offensive game plan? Because Mayo give you space. The way they play, they will give opportunity and they will give Tyrone chances to hit them hard on the counter attack. And if Tyrone can mix up that game on the counter attack, because they're brilliant at it, they're brilliant at it. They, they're probably mm. better running the ball. Uh, that that's in their DNA, but they but they've also kind of tried to mix that game up in terms of kicking it as well, and 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 that's that's probably why we 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 didn't really see Dublin expose maybe weaknesses that were there in Mayo when, when they do leave you one on one and they leave that space inside, you know. Yeah, um, it's it's quite remarkable, Desi, when you think about the job James Horn has done second time round. Um, Chris O'Connor has a piece in the Examiner today. He just says he, he's done the maths, which I think has been done before. But in three years, thirty-eight players have made their league debut, and twenty-three have made their ta- their championship debut. Um, there's only eleven play eleven players which featured against Dublin made their championship debut against Horn in the last three seasons, and there was which logically means there's only four survivors from the twenty seventeen All Ireland final. Like he has completely overhauled a team that okay, it was aging, but. In, in a lot of other counties, that wouldn't be considered an aging team. It would be considered an experienced team. But in Mayo, where they have, you know, an abundance of wealth of footballers, let's be honest, James Horn said, no, it's net, like he just grasped the nettle in year one. And then he ripped the nettle out of the ground in year two. And to be going into back-to-back All-Ireland football finals, having done that rebuilding job is astonishing. It is. Um, I be, I was down in Castle Bar twice when I watched them play at Mead in the league game and then I was down for the Leitrim game and to be honest I was the game itself was pretty incredible I was really impressed with the culture of the players how they how professional they looked uh, the panel the way they behaved carried themselves the game went in just like there was massive changes against Leitrim with the COVID situation but it didn't affect them one bit they went out and blitzed them they could have won by as much as they wanted really um, the game finished up and then this is where I was just blown away. I was astonished. They, they, they threw down the panel of players. So you have your subs. You have the subs that came in and played a little bit of the game. You have some of the starters. And then you have the panel members. And at the end of the match, every single one of them was down the pitch. And depending on the work rate that you did during the game, that's when you finish your running. But they're running 21 to 21 for about 45, 50 minutes. And what he's done is every single player on that panel is doing the same workload. And now, Wilo, you'd remember being on county panels where there'd be a lad and he'd be eating the jellies and be eating the pasta and he wouldn't be doing a thing the whole time. And he's just, just sitting on the panel. Happy days. Not happy, happy, happy to sit on the bench. Happy to sit on the bench. I've got the gear. And he's back of the coach. And, have to yeah, play. and he's, <laughs> he's heading to coppers with the boys and, he's, and everyone's chatting. And he's loving time, life. He's loving life. Like, it's the dream ticket. Like. And in Mayo, I came across the pitch. And Milo, you played with Kieran McDonald the same as I did. And I came across it. Just, Jesus, Kieran. What's the story with these lads? They're going bananas here. He's, and I think, I don't want state secrets or whatever. He says, look, Everyone has to do the same work rate. Right? If you haven't, if you didn't do it during the match, you do it after the match. If you were a sub that came on and had to reach your target, you do it after the match. If you're a sub that didn't play, you have to get the work in. And if you're a panel member, you're the same as everybody else. I've also heard stories about, as I, I don't know how much is true. That's the next man in philosophy that well, he implies, a, a, Desi, a, and it probably shows why when they can lose, arguably their best ever forward. Exactly. Uh, it doesn't exactly. knock a shot out of them, like you know. You're seeing lads coming in that you haven't heard of, like and like Enda Hessian, they came in the last day, but like the running power, the athleticism, what what James Horn and Kieran McDonald have doing, they've created a culture that this is the expectation of every single player in the Mayo panel, and we have any amount of them. And if you want to be that player, like your poor Kahora that comes in, 
he is ready to go. He is at the fitness level. He has all, all the work done. You're not waiting for him to develop. And that is the culture that James Horne has introduced to Mayo. And it's quite incredible. I think myself, he's done a great job. Unbelievable other, job. Unbe- unbelievable. I've also heard stories. The game finishes in Mullingar. They head back to Ballyhonis. And the panel members play a match A versus B. He gets an extra couple of players in to fulfill the match. And he, that's even after they play the match in Mullingar after the National League game. So what he's done is created a total professional environment. He's 37 or 8 players ready to go at his beck and call any minute. Mm. Equally, I would say, Brian Dewar and Fergal Logan. And I will say this, Kieran McGarry has been around a while. Mm. Conor Myler has been around a while. I don't, know what's, I don't know what's different this year, but they're playing out with their skin, these boys. And I suppose that's, that's what new management gives. And that's why I suppose people were calling Mickey Hart. The professionalism was always there with Mickey Hart. But there was probably a feeling that had gone a little bit stale. stale and I think yeah, what they needed a freshness. I, I think what you're seeing this year is you're seeing some of the lads are reinvigorated. I did not see Kieran McGarry play like anything like he's playing. He's Football on the year, level. Uh, number well, one on, candidate at the moment. If the win, he's got it. Like he's yeah. even, um, I will say Niall Morgan, that kick was a joke of a kick the last day. I, I was like <laughs> in commentary going... I think it's 73 metres. <laughs> right? Downtown stuff. But I have to say, I think he indulged himself a little bit during that match. I think he needs to improve uh, his kicking on 45s. He's been poor. He's more, missing more than he's getting. Towards the end of the game, when he just needed to wind down the clock, he was having pot shots at the goal from out near the sideline. There was lads standing all around him, scratching their heads. He is a good goalie, but he needs to have a bit more discipline, I think. going for, in, Into an All-Ireland final, he needs to think of the team. He seems to have a bit of a, a spark about him, I suppose, which, and that's the good and the bad side of it. Um, you, you mentioned the professionalism, and it, it just struck me there, Rory, that um, it's hard to get away from the fact that, you know, <laughs> when Dublin reach an All-Ireland final and win an All-Ireland final, we talk a lot about finances and resources. There's no getting away from the fact that we're also, we're dealing with, like, two incredibly well-resourced counties here who can afford to run professional, you know, as professional uh, inter-county setup as you like, and... It shows in terms of we will have a feature on the RT website this weekend about their strength and conditioning of the two teams. Arguably, it's the it's the main calling card of both teams is that their, you know, their fitness is beyond belief. They can, which means that they can play a certain style of game. Um, and as Desi just detailed, how they do that, um, which means you have to get an awful lot of buy-in from lads for an awful lot of time from their personal lives. And there's also all the coaches in the background and stuff, like. There's the 15, 20 who play on the pitch, but like these are like, as professional uh, inter county setups as you can see, really, aren't they? Yeah, I did like the, the you know, uh, top of the range, but I think there aren't too many. I mean, there's 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 four that have managed to sort of dominate the latter stages of the championships, probably now for the best part of maybe seven, eight, nine, ten years, which is Dublin Mayo, Kerry, Tyrone. They've been in lots of semi finals, lots of finals between the four of them. But if you kind of take the next tier down, I mean, and obviously those four counties are hugely well resourced. Finance isn't an issue, and they have, you know, they, they want for nothing. They get the best of everything. But if you take the next kind of tier down, which is, we'll say, Monaghan, Armagh, Donegal, they're not too far away from that. They would probably have similar types of resources. If they don't, they sh- they should have. And then there's probably another tranche that's kind of, you know, on the next level down, which would probably be Galway, Roscommon, Cork, Mead and Kildare, who should be certainly aspiring to get up there and should be, you know, looking to try and develop that type of culture as well. And I think you could look at a situation like what, what, what the, next couple of tran- the, the next couple of tiers down, they now, I think, should be seeing this as an opportunity. Kerry are definite. Kerry are coming, and they'll probably win a couple over the next couple of years. Fine, but this isn't a this isn't a behemoth coming from Kerry. Like this is still a Kerry with loads of flaws. Dublin have come back to the pack. Mayo and Toronto are in this year's final, and they're of a very similar standard, and that's why this final is so hard to call. So all the teams at the top, this isn't like Dublin now where Dublin have dominated for 10 years. I think all the teams at the top have, they all they all have their fall, faults and foibles. I think the chase and pack now should see this as a major opportunity to try and get in there. If the championship restructures, we won't get into that, affords an opportunity for Gaelic football to really flesh out a top eight, top 12. I think we could be, we could be 
and fingers crossed <laughs> for, all, for all of us that love it, we could be moving into a really, really healthy era and a healthy period for Gaelic football. And I think that's to be welcomed. Yeah. Um, we've mentioned, obviously, the rebuilding job, Wilo, of, of Mayo. And it's, it's not a rebuilding job that Toronto have done because, as we said, a lot of those players have been there. But there's been a rejuvenation. And it's, it's too simplistic to say, well, oh, they've, they've moved away from the straitjacket of Mickey Hart's defensive form of football because they did they're for a while. Still yeah, playing they it. did move away from it and they've kind of, they've come back to it, but clearly they've rejigged it. Clearly they've looked at some players who weren't favourites of Mickey Hart's, shall we say, um, McCurry kind of being the obvious one, uh, benefited from the return of Conor McKenna and obviously the emergence of, you know, a super sub, shall we call him at this stage, the son of God. He's 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 no more than a super sub yet, even though I think we all know there's great things to come from him. Um, so like the two lads, and they've had a difficult season. Like they, <laughs> we we won't relive, um, we won't relive your your um ringside seat for uh Kavanaugh no, Beast Milan again. again Mikey, please. No, we won't. <laughs> I was just going to reference it in so much as they've had a difficult season, whatever your views on the Who's COVID issue. Do we know? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't you start. Um, they've had a difficult season, yet they have taken largely similar group of players and they've brought them to an All-Ireland final where in many people's eyes they are the favourites. Yeah, and, and let's see, there's, I suppose new management brings just a freshness to it and you got a sense in Tyrone over the last I certainly did over the last five six uh, years that there were just a split county um, you know Mickey Hart had legendary status up there what he delivered in the noughties and there was you know there was a growing feeling that they kind of needed something different and you could you could just got that and I think that just leaked into the team and and they probably just needed a change a freshness and and you know that's that can revitalize guys, you know what I mean? And 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 they did try to mix it up. But as I said, they have kind of nearly kind of gone slightly more conservative bit by bit. Now I think after Killarney, they've kind of you can see they have a very strong defensive structure, even giving up kickouts, that sort of stuff. It's 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 leaning towards uh, more of a defensive style of football, but mixing it up on, on counter-attack. And, and to be honest, they're probably, even you, you go back to Mickey Hart's days, if you go back, I don't know if anyone recalls the league game down in Castle Bar, where Tyrone played uh, May, I think it was, was it last year, the year before? 19. Uh, Conor McKenna was just back, wasn't it? It was 19, wasn't it? Yeah. And they bombed balls into the Mayo full back line and, and Tyrone caused them awful difficulties, do you know what I mean? So uh, that's, even if you go back to that, you know, even there, they were beginning, I think, to try and to mix it up because there was a feeling they need to bring a different something to the different to the game plan. But there's, there is that huge freshness about them and there is that mental strength. And, you know, I, I thought it was remarkable the last day because, you know, it'd be very honest going into that game and you were thinking so many lads out with COVID and, you know, the recovery from COVID and all the stories that we heard and all that sort of stuff. Now, I know they're missing a few, you know, Richie Donnelly, uh, did, didn't play. Rory Brennan was obviously out. Mark Bradley only got a couple of minutes. So they, they obviously were had a few guys that were impacted on it. But the, the performance was just uh, phenomenal considering, you know, they they didn't, like, let's be honest, they didn't have much time on the training field. They had very, very little time to actually work and, and develop a plan to play against Kerry. Uh, and what they pulled off was, was was remarkable. And you have to give massive credit to, 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 to Logan and Doha. Um, and I, I go back, I think Rory's right. Like you're, this this weekend, you've, I'm sure you've Donegal looking on and you've Armagh and you've Mon and saying, What a chance. No, we, we, that could be us. That yeah. could be us. Uh, and, and similar Galway in, 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 in Mayo, in, in Connacht as well. And, and it probably gives huge belief and hope that, you know, that dream, that fella's dream of around the country that, you know, do you know what? You know, we'll bounce back into training ne- next year because if the, those guys come in on all Ireland, there's no doubt about we can as well. And and, and that, that's only good for football. Yeah. Um, we'll look at a few a few key matchups, I guess, Desi, which is which is always something we do. Um we'll we'll start with the, the Tyrone forwards, I I guess it's um if you take it that the same the same six we're gonna start, which is I suppose up for debate as well. It's um McKenna obviously is, he made quite the impact the last day. Um, but as, as we will, I think mentioned earlier, he is he's inclined to work his way back a bit. Does that mean that you know he's not really a man you have to tag full time because he is kind of he's filtering back a bit or seeing as he's you know, he got two goals in a league match last year that relegated Mayo and yeah. he got two goals the last day against Kerry, he would seem like a man you'd want to keep a tight enough rein on. 
he is a versatile player. He, a lot of his good work done during the year was done out the pitch. Um, his work rate, he, lads, is phenomenal. Yeah, his work yeah. rate is phenomenal. And then he popped up with two goals. So then you're going to go, okay, he's after adding that to the game. Well, that's something you'd keep an eye on. To be honest, I have to say, as a corner forward, um, you know, you have, throwing your defenders, you throw in the wheelos in the world with the big gloves, catching the ball in midfield, <laughs> bashing and all that. But you need forwards to win games. And, <laughs> and I have to say, um, it, going into this, both sets of forwards, it's not like you had your cons, you had your gooches, you had the, the, the forwards in the both sets of teams this year. While Darren McCurry had a good season, like Tom Thomas Sullivan cleaned him out the last day. Mally Donnelly, again, like Conor McKenna, does a lot of work out the pitch as well. Like, it's not your classic set of forwards staying in, getting it. Like, the scores are coming from, if you think it's her own, the scores two from Niall Morgan, Michael McCairn, and cornerback, one, two, three, four, and seven got scores the last day. So, like, that's where I think it's an interesting one. Positions, and with this athleticism that we talked about, it's nearly all out the window. The lads are like, Lee Keegan came up for Mayo, he's scoring. It's, it, it, you don't know where the scores are going to come from is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, Conor McKenna dropping out, you need someone to follow him. Probably Lee Keegan is a good choice to follow him because if you can get Lee up the pitch a little bit as well, it kind, mm. of, it kind of excites people in Mayo as well because if Lee Keegan has a good game, it's massive for Mayo as well because I just think he's such a, such a leader in that camp. Um, Darren McCurry is a clever player. I was, he was very quiet. He was really struggling. Then he sneaks out into the pocket, gets a free shot, gets a lovely score. So, like, that's what he can offer. Matty Donnelly is interesting, guys. In full forward line, he's not the most natural mover of the ball. Like, he's not the most, you know, slick. He did a nice dummy against Monaghan, I think it was. But, again, a, a vital player for Tyrone. But, again, his best work is out the pitch. Like, so... It's a, it's a really interesting one. Like, who's going to... Like, you need fellas to go and to follow, and that's what they're going to be doing, like, and stick to the men. I think if they, you know, if they don't start Bradley or whatever, and he even played a little deeper against Monaghan, like, you have to think, yeah, if they, they're going to leave McShane and Canavan on the bench. So, your inside yeah. two, like, are going to be probably in the first half, Donnelly and, and, and McCurry. You know, I... I, could, and I, 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 did t- I agree with you, Kieran. Yeah. Like, like, Tyrone needs to be a bit more offensive this time. The average before the Kerry match, the average 18 points a game before the Kerry match. Even, that like, could, but even, even, even in the semi-final, Desi, 14 points in 105 minutes of football. Yeah. It's not... Like I know, go- I know, I know, look, oh, goals. Well, the, go- the goals. But it's still, it's on it's average... Like 14 points in 105 minutes of football. It's not a lot in a modern inter-county game. Well, it's an average, again, of... They were struggling to get goals going into that game. It's an average of 17, 18 scores. That's what Tyrone will get. Which, I suppose, like, it's... I still think they need to get more. I still think creatively up front, it's not your Canavan O'Neill, it's not your Muggsy up there. It's a bit more limited, but then the game has changed as well. Everything is built on them defences. The big names, your Lee Keegans, I'm thinking Ronan McNamee, uh, Porra Campsey, the big names, Kieran McGarry, they're in the defence. You have Oshin Mullen in centre-back. The big names are in the defence in this match. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tyrone could do with a couple of uh, Mayo own goals, maybe to bolster their own scoring. <laughs> but we won't go there. Um, it, is, it, it is interesting in that respect, Rory, isn't it? That, you know, the idea of kind of matchups is dangerous because, you know, we all, because as you say, with the, the manner in which Tyrone play, you don't want to be, you don't want to be in the kind of the Gooch situation where you're tracking Philly McMahon, you know, a hundred yards up the field and watching him score a point and tiring yourself out. So they're, how teams set up and how they, you know, allow for these extra players coming back while keeping the men they want to keep up, you know, at the right end of the field mm-hmm. is, um, it is like, well, we're talking about chaos and these teams being incredibly well conditioned. There's, there's going to be a, a, a very interesting sideline tactical battle here as well, isn't there? Big time. And like the the matchups thing, I'm not so sure if Mayo will get overly hung up on it. I think they'll identify two or three, two, maybe three um, from a Tyrone perspective. And then they'll just, I, I think they'll settle in. I mean, if, if Tyrone want to make the game ragged and loose and almost like a sevens like type uh, game and kind of, you know, introduce that element of chaos. Well, sure. That's grist to the mill from Mayo's perspective. That'll be right up there, Ali. I think Mayo, Tyrone will actually want this slightly more structured in the way that Kerry kind of fell into the trap in that concede the kick out, drift back, bottle them up, turn them over, break quickly. That's pretty much their game plan. 
There's no major magic or secret to it. And I don't really see them diverging too much from that template come Saturday. What they may throw in in classic Tyrone fashion, whether it's Canavan on or off, whether it's the McMahons into the full back line, the curveball from a Tyrone perspective might be in a positional switch. And it may be even in a somebody that starts the game that you weren't possibly expecting. But other than that, I don't see Tyrone di- di- drifting too much from their game plan. I think Mayo will know pretty much what's coming. Big questions from a Mayo perspective will be if Owen McLaughlin doesn't make it, and I can't see how he c- could, given the nature of the injury, <clears throat> then is it somebody like Cullen Boyle that comes in? I think that's a brilliant replacement, by the way, if you do have to make that sw- swap in. And then ultimately is what you do with Aidan O'Shea. And again, to go back to the 2016 um, quarterfinal, and then I, go, I know, again, it's five years, it's an Aidan O'Shea at 26 as opposed to 31. But they definitely was, he started at midfield, he drifted in full forward, he laid off a couple of scores, maybe even two or three points for Andy Moore and Alan Dillon, then drifted back out to centre forward, back out to midfield again to start the second half, drift back in again. And maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the, I, I mean, I, like be interested in the lads' views. I know we all Before know. Before we get poor, their views, we all know one. how poor, poorly he played the last yeah. day, and how big a player he is. Obviously, he's their captain too, so you will need a big performance from him. And I think you might get it as well. Yeah. So it's but it's just, it's just about where best to imply him, I suppose. Yeah. Just just to note to all those who get het up about how much we talk about Aidan O'Shea, we're at least 40 minutes into this podcast yeah. before his name is mentioned. So yeah, there you go. we're allowed to talk about him now. We bought the right by <laughs> we, we showed discretion. Player, like. Yeah, yeah, he's a very important player. But Wheelow, he, he only had five interactions, but he only had five involvements on the ball, I think, in the first half before he was hooked the last day. Like yeah. he's clearly a fantastic football. Even fantastic Messi, Ronaldo, um, whoever, Peter Canavan, whoever you want to mention, um, everybody has a bad day. Everyone has a bad day. He had a bad day in the office, there's no doubt about it. But he, he still, you know, a few tweaks, he could have two, three points. And if you take the positives out of it, some of the ball that went in stuck um, and he won it and he still gives them a different dynamic in there. Uh, and like, there's no doubt he'll start. This nonsense very one. Like, <laughs> yeah, of course, like, of course well, a lot of rubbish. Yeah. Of course he's going to start. And, and I do think they will... They will pull him in and out because they they be trying to pull the Tyrone defence. Now Tyrone will be smart enough. I expect Mac and me will, will will match up with him, but he might pass him off if he goes out the field and be happy to take on whoever comes inside. You know what I mean? Um, you know you have Hampsey there as well, who's obviously going to match up with somebody. Whether that's Tommy Conroy, whether they bring Rory Brennan in maybe to do a job there, because then you've you've Ryan O'Donoghue, which will will cause plenty of problems as well. But I I think for me, and you, you can look at the other end of the field and. Obviously, Mayo have very good options in the full full back line to match up with with McCurry. You've probably got Pauli Gahara, Lee Keegan can match up if he's back there. You know, they have options. But for me, I think it's in the, around the middle is going to be crucial. Uh, because like if you look at Mayo perspective, Matt, Matty Ruan has been probably one of their best players all year. Like rest assured, one of Tyrone's objectives will be to turn him over once or twice in the first 15, 20 minutes, you know, and you would see so the, like, the likes of Nagiri will be tagged to try and really watch him, tag him. They'll double up on him uh, they, because that would be a big psychological win to get into his headspace because he he's, has to be hugely influential. I think Myler will probably track Paddy Durkin again. You know, he's done a really good job, you know, done the Paddy Clifford job the last day he'll kind of, the influence that Durkin could have because Mayo can probably afford to play Durkin in that six role and push him forward. So I actually think it's in around the, the, the battles around the middle are going to be crucial to, 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 to setting up the attacks and, 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 and get, giving teams a platform. But yeah, the Aiden O'Shea one, he, he, he's, he's, I think everyone can have a really, really bad day in the office. Um, I suppose <clears throat> the critique that's thrown at him will be delivering in all Ireland finals. You know, he can put all the, his critics to bed on, 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 on Saturday evening by delivering a performance. Um, and let's be honest about it, like anybody that was in a player's position, you know, if you're in his position the last day, you're seriously pissed off. Uh, while, while you won, you're, you're pissed off. And that, that can be a driving force coming into final that he's determined to kind of make a statement uh, because I'm sure he, 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 he Deep down, when he's tried to ignore it, he knows that plenty of people have spoken about him in the last few weeks, and he'd be able to try and put that record straight. I'd say. Okay, lads, I think Desi has a class coming up, and Ursula Jacob has entered uh-huh. the waiting room, so I better, uh, <laughs> we better get on with our predictions here. I'll start. I'm going to upset my fans in Outer Mongolia. 
and say that I think Tyrone are going to win. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my, my, my thinking here is they just seem like a team who know exactly what they're doing. And while Mayo also do, there's also the, the curse. No, I'm joking. I just think Tyrone actually just look like a very, a very well-balanced, fully formed team. So I'm going for them. Wheelow, we'll go with you next. Uh, it's a tough one, Mikey. Um, like, I, I keep coming back to that chaos piece uh, where Mayo have that athleticism to go man to man. And the fact if Tyrone are predictable in how they set up, that I'd be amazed if Horn hasn't, you know, invested a lot of energy in, in terms of if, he, if they give that much possession, what we will do with it um, and use it wisely. And I think I think Mayo's time might finally come and they'll just fall over the line. Desi? Just because you're asking me, I think this game is on the knife edge, but just because you're saying predict one over another, I'm just yeah. going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to pick Mayo because I have friends in Mayo. I've seen them suffer <laughs> miserably for a long time. I feel sorry for them. I do. I, I um, They have a fantastic team, fantastic manager, Tyrone equally. But just when you say pick a team, um, James Horn is astute. He's clever. He's created a great culture down there. Kerry, you mentioned Wheel at the very start, 35 turnovers. James Horn had an extra bit of time to analyze this Tyrone team. You don't bring it down the channels. You don't bring it into trouble. If you bring it into contact, you're going to get suffered. You're going to suffer as a result. So I think Mayo, if they, if they have get their tactics right, <clears throat> avoid them turnovers, that's fuel for Tyrone. And, and, and just, just, I suppose, their athleticism has been so incredible. Um, I'm just going to give it to them. But just because you're asking, because I think it's going to be a fascinating arm wrestle on Saturday evening. Um, I'm glad you didn't refuse to answer. It was good of you, Desi. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Rory? <clears throat> yeah. No, firstly, I would def- I would, I'm planning on a long evening. Um, I think it could actually go to extra time. But even if it did go to extra time, I still think Mayo... <sighs> I'd hate like counterattacking football is can be very effective and very good to watch in its own right. But if this year's All Ireland was a triumph for that sort of defensive mindset, which I thought we were trying to get away from, I think it would be a victory for the type of coaching that I'd hope football and that vortex of shite that we were in for ten years we were coming out of. So. I'm kind of hoping, not that I have any allegiance to Mayo overthrowing one way or the other. My name is O'Neill for for, for Jay's sake, but um, I just think Mayo play a better brand of football. And I think if they really go for it, if they play for 70 minutes, not the kind of fits and starts that we've probably seen the 20 minutes against Galway, maybe just after half time or the last 20 minutes uh, against Dublin when the game kind of dragged itself into the melting pot. I think if they, they play from 70 minutes start to finish, I think they'll have too much for Tyrone. And I, I fancy Mayo. Okay, that's that's three to one then. If Tyrone win, we're definitely doing a, follow, we're definitely doing a, po- a, a review podcast next week, lads. Like, me would be 500 euros from Ballina Credit Union, waving it in your faces. Oh, that's what I mean. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much, Kira and Desi. Uh, enjoy the match, lads, and we will catch you again. Um, we're going to be back now in a second to review the Camogie final with Ursula Jacob and Elaine Aylward. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy Moses! Uh, welcome back. Uh, as I as I promised, we've been joined by Ursula Jacob and Elaine Aylward to, Aylward to look forward to the senior Camogie final between Old Foes, Galway and Cork. Um, Rory has stayed with us too. Um, so we have some... Uh, a bit, bit in... Bit of news from this morning, obviously, is that the uh, the uh, that uh, rather uh, unfortunate case of mistaken identity from the semi final has ha- has been cleared up, Ursula, and uh, Dervla Higgins has been cleared to play after you know it was rightly established that she uh, had ab- she had absolutely uh, no hand or part in uh, the foul play that that occurred. Um, but then <laughs> the the guilty party is also still innocent. So it's uh, it's a bit of a, it's a double bonus for Galway really, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. You know, Galway are very, very, very lucky that they have, you know, Emma available for the final because obviously, you know, it was her who who uh, struck the player. But thankfully for Dervla, 
Higgins, Higgins, who, you know, wrongfully was, was sent off in the sem semi-final. And you could see her, you know, confusion when she was sent to the line because, in fairness, you know, Dervla was, was completely innocent. But it's great that, you know, she is available for the final. But you'll, you'll probably have some court supporters not happy that, you know, Emma is, is available to play. But I suppose that's the rules. And, you know, Galway will just be happy that they can move on from it now. Yeah. Rory, are you enraged? Well, I do think it's very, like, it's... We had this discussion, Mikey, in and around the Peter Casey um, red card for the Limerick Hurlers in, in advance of the semi-final, where I felt that a sending off and a ban shouldn't be mutually exclusive. I think sometimes you deserve to be sent off, but you don't deserve to actually miss the All-Ireland final as a result. And I think there can be mitigating circumstances brought into this, which is track record which is maybe provocation, which I think were prob possibly both applicable in Arla Cronin's case. And I think it's very, very harsh. Now, I don't think they have given up just yet. I know that they've gone to one level so far and obviously they've failed, but they have two more avenues to go. Um, but like, let's make no bones about it. If she's missing, it's a massive blow, massive blow for Cork. Yeah. Um and I have to say, I was almost heartened because, you know, I'm, as the uh, the online sports editor in RT, I'm kind of, you know, I, I keep a very close eye on the social media interactions, which you can imagine are many. And around the Sunday game, it's always great. And I just thought, this is great. Equality of, uh, of coverage and of reaction in men's and women's Gaelic games, because the reaction to the Sunday game segment on Orla Cronin's sending off was every bit as batshit mental and furious as it ever would be for a hurling or men's football um emotions were running just as high and i thought this is great this is as it should be there's no uh <laughs> there, there's there's nobody seen any difference here and uh it was a very it was a decision that that divided people not just between cork people and non-cork people but there's a lot of people who felt that what she did wasn't a red card and i would say i come down in the other camp where if you hit someone a belt of the hurl in the head it's probably a red card, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, look, and I suppose it comes on the back then of a couple of weeks of a couple of red cards in Camogie. You know, we had Catherine Finnerty off the ball one in the group game between Galway mm. and Kilkenny. And we had the Galway one the last day and obviously the Orla Cronin one then. So I think we've come from a position where for years it was nearly impossible to get a red card in Camogie because the idea was kind of like, should the girls wouldn't be hitting one another, you know, and you couldn't <laughs> get a red card in Camogie. <laughs> and now, as you said, it's come to be the hot topic on the Sunday game, the night of the All-Ireland Camogie semi-finals. Obviously, we'd prefer if it wasn't there and if it was the game we we're talking about but look it's part and parcel of the games now we've been crying out for years to have more physicality consistency in the refereeing and all the rest of it and I think this comes with it then it's par for the course and mm -hmm. look to be honest I, I'm coming down on the side that if it's a red card it's a red card and it shouldn't matter whether it's the first round of the league or a challenge game or whether it's the All-Ireland semi-final I think the punishment should be the same and um, I don't think there's any precedence in the rule book for or it's a red card and a sending off on All-Ireland final day but not on any other day or vice versa so look it's harsh she will be a huge loss to Cork if she's missing but I think now it's up to the Camogie so to have the, the gumption to stand by their convictions. Like obviously, the loophole in the Galway one is as loopholes tend to be in GA rule books and Camogie rule books. It's there. It's probably something that the Camogie Association need to look at going forward if it's going to become an issue that those loopholes are closed up. But look, as we saw in the Peter Casey one, they're still there in the GA rule book. So it's hard to get over them. But as it stands, I suppose Orla is going to miss the, the All Ireland final and that's the price she's paying. Yeah. It, it... The semi finals were interesting in a lot of respects. Um, or so I'm, I'm one like it's a fairly basic thing, but they were played in Croke Park, which is was a first or first in a long time at least. I won't say it's a first rather than Parky Queeve. So all the players will have had a very recent experience of playing in Croke Park. And it's always said before the All Ireland final that Croke Park is a different pitch. This is like you know, this is a different atmosphere, this is a different situation, and some players will adapt better than others. That's kind of out the window now, isn't it? You've got two sets of players here who should be completely comfortable in their dressing room with the rigmarole before the game and with the dimensions of the pitch. There's no there's no unpleasant surprises here for either team, I don't think, is there? Yeah, and that's the brilliant thing about the, the games being played there for the semi-finals because, you know, as you said, Crow Park is a different experience and for some of the younger girls, it can be quite daunting. For Galway, you know, they've played the league final there this year as well. So they've the added, you know, bonus of that. But... Cork are a very experienced outfit. Polly Murray knows 
the ins and outs of every grain of grass uh, in Crow Park. So he'll have them well, well drilled. And for me, Crow Park suits this Cork team. You know, I would have said it in, in advance of the semi final against Kilkenny. Cork thrive in Crow Park. You know, the space, you know, they, their running game is what this Cork team's about. You know, the dual players like the Hannah Looney's and Libby Coppingers, they love this kind of space. And then when you have, you know, the likes of Amy O'Connor in the forwards or Chloe Sigerson, they've got so much space in Crow Park. And, it, and, it, and to me, that is an advantage to Cork because I think, you know, the bigger the pitch, the, the more they thrive on. But Galway as well will be equally, you know, comfortable there. You know, their last, up, up until the semi final, their last two um, games in Crow Park would have been defeats, you know, in the All Ireland final. So, they, you know, that win against Tipperary is going to be. Uh, would have been, you know, important to them because, you know, you can kind of get into a habit of losing in Crow Park and that can be a tough pill to swallow. But now, you know, they got over the line against Tipperary. I suppose it was a far from convincing performance and they will have to, you know, pick things up massively, you know, to, to beat Cork on Sunday. But, you know, Cahill Murray will just be happy that they're back for a third consecutive final again, but will want to make amends for last year's defeat to Kilkenny. Yeah, uh, Elaine, I guess we've been crying out for a bit more like some competition for shall we say the, the big three there because I, I think i've probably mentioned before you think you go back to 2012 and wexford uh wexford's appearance for the last time anyone outside of cork galway or kilkenny was it was in a final so part of it could be hand-wringing and saying jesus galway just you know galway were unconvincing in the semi-final but maybe the other way of looking at it is, is after several years of kind of kind of clambering up the ladder, Tipperary are, you know, finally a, a, a team to be reckoned with and Galway perhaps have had a proper test coming into this final. Yeah, absolutely. Tipper on the up and look, I was so impressed with them all year. I think they'll be visually disappointed having finished the league campaign and the championship campaign at the semi-final stage because the two semi-finals were two games they could so easily have won. Like they should have beaten Kilkenny down in Nolan Park in the league semi-final, did everything right, you know. Hurled well, responded really well to all Kilkenny's goals, got the scores when they needed them. They just didn't win the game. And similar to the All-Ireland semi-final last weekend, you know, they hurled really, really well with Galway for such a long patch of that game. They dominated the second half and created probably four or five goal chances and just didn't take them. So they're making steps. But look, I think that breakthrough needs to come and it needs to come sooner rather than later. My fear for Tipperary now is this team is fairly well established. There's a good few of them around at while now. You have the likes of Ordo Dewar now going back to Australia, maybe next year going back a little bit sooner and missing an All-Ireland semi-final. And, and slowly that group of girls starts to break up a little bit and they just haven't quite made the, the breakthrough so look I would have hoped it would have been this year I would have thought it could have been this year and when it wasn't then your fear would just be that another year will have slipped by things will start to break away a little bit and that maybe they won't finally make that step but certainly the confidence is there and I just feel that they do need to just take out one of those big three on some big day and then the floodgates could open and we could be looking at tip for a long time but until they do that they're still in that fourth position yeah um look at this rory cork i think cork's kind of we 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 we, we previewed the football when we were talking about you know the the tyrone and they're you know having the luxury of keeping the likes of uh dara canavan and colin mcshane on the bench um the the tactic the last day of keeping your captain linda collins linda, on the bench yeah. and springing her <laughs> it worked a treat hmm? i think she if a for if if or if if or uh cronin doesn't get off. I have a feeling Linda will probably start. I don't know what where the whether the girls would agree with me on that. Yeah. Um, would you think so? Yeah, no, I, I think so. I think she'll be the automatic choice to start if if Orla is not available because yeah. I couldn't see why you would why you would be leaving Linda on the on the line if Orla is not starting. You need yeah. your leaders playing on Sunday and Cork need to start their best team. I think she might. And I think from Cork's perspective, <clears throat> like I know um, Ursula made a point that they would have a lot of experience, but they've lost a lot of experience as well. I know Gemma, Gemma O'Connor went recently. I know Orla Cotter is was did she emigrate? She go to America or yeah. Australia, and they obviously lost Breege, who has was you know gave incredible service. And but the good news from a Cork perspective is that they, they were competing in uh, in minor finals again up to recently. They made a third minor final in a row. We're going for three in a row. Got stopped by Kilkenny in a brilliant match by all accounts. I only got to see the highlights. 
Um, so they've got some good players coming through and they've bedded in um, a lot of good young players again. So I think they're set fair and Paddy Murray's done a really good job in transitioning the team. From what I can gather, I think Ashing Thompson might be the oldest player at 28 or 29. Um, starting on Sunday, which is, you know, gives you an indication of where they're at now in terms of experience and potentially the team developing over the next few years. And uh, the big thing for me is there's two, two key aspects, I think, from Cork's perspective going in against Galway. Number one, they have a brilliant record against Galway. I think they've only been beaten by Galway in one All-Ireland final, which is actually the very first one that Galway won back in 96. And they've won every every time they've met in finals since. So they assert, I know tradition mightn't come from much, but it does come for something. Um, the second thing, which I think is maybe slightly overlooked, is there's about three or four dual players. And with the footballers gone out so early, I think those players now have more or less been concentrating 100% on hurling for the last couple of weeks. And I think that will make a big difference with the, the Hanalunis and you know, like th these types of players now concentrate on hurling only. I think that, you know, just sharpens up your game in a big way. And I'd expect a, a big performance from a lot of those players. And I think it will give them a chance because they'll have it all to do. They arguably came through the tougher side of the draw. Um, people could argue, in fairness, that Galway maybe had the handier side and maybe that Cork are slightly more battle-hardened going in. But I think it'll still be very tight, very hard one to call. And as I said, like with Orla, with Orla Cronin out now, I think that is that you know that is um, that's a bit of a leveler in my view. Um, but Rory, just going back on your point sorry. there about the dual players yeah. in the league semi final this year with Cork and Galway when it went to extra time, Hannah Looney actually had to come off in that game. Yeah. Bushed. Um, Absolutely bushed. because she yeah. was completely fatigued. Yeah. They had played football the day before. So yeah, she's go. not at all fatigued. She's probably playing the best hurling she's played since she's come into the car panel. Yeah. And I fully agree with you that them being able to solely concentrate on the camogie it is has a big been advantage. A, a huge boost yeah. to Cork. Yeah. yeah, big boost. Yeah, I think uh, it even showed in the semi final. I think I think Hannah Looney probably had one of her best games from Cork. Libby Coppinger held Casey Libby, Bird two yeah. points from play. There you go. And Maeve Cahalan stormed into the game. So yeah. I think that yeah. freshness and the fact that they'd had three full weeks to concentrate on Harlan, I think really showed in the semi final. And that's had, only going to come on again with the extra two weeks. Uh, had they had they gotten over Mead? we'll say in the football semi-final, they would have been playing football up until last weekend, which would have only given them one week now to concentrate. Yeah. And they're three big players, as you mentioned. So I think that is a big boost, certainly. Interesting that you both, that you all raised that as an issue, because to me, I just look back and say, it didn't really harm them that much for the last 15 or 20 years. <laughs> but, as you get but older, again, though. Yeah. And I think at the, you know, the higher end of the scale, come an All-Ireland final or a league final, when you're up against the best opposition, you can't afford to be fatiguing in the last five or ten minutes. That's when you really need to kick yeah. on. So um, I think it's a huge boost and a positive for Cork. Okay. Uh, or so sticking with you there, where where do you see the key matchups in in this match? I think the midfield battle is going Ashley to be huge. Ashley Thompson and Cork Ashley, completely yeah. dominated that in the semi final against Kilkenny. Uh, as we just mentioned, Hannah Looney probably had her best game um, in a Cork jersey in the semi-final. Ashling Thompson is coming back to her best form as well. And they're two very physically imposing players. They're not afraid to attack, but they're also extremely comfortable at, you know, helping back in defence as well. So they're coming up against a kind of two different kind of players. Neve Kilkenny, you know, probably the best midfielder of my generation, um, you know, consistently has performed at the highest level. And, this year, you know, Galway have tried a couple of different players out around there. Neve Hanafy started the semi-final. Um, sometimes I probably feel that Neve might be more beneficial closer to the goal, but she she's able to cover a huge amount of ground as well. And I think whoever gets on top of that battle um, can pr will really prove crucial in the final because, you know, as I said, Cork dominated in the semi-final. Uh, Neve Kilkenny, if we remember two years ago in the final against Kilkenny, cleared a match performance got three or four super scores and she can she can you know be that match winning player uh, if, if she's given the time and space but I've no doubt you know Cork are going to really trying to you know minimize her influence on the game but yeah that's that's going to be the key area for me yeah and, and Elaine, Elaine, Hanifee, 
sorry, just on that one, Neve Hanifi mm. is probably a foil for Neve Kilkenny at midfield. Neve Hanifi would be a bigger, more physical player, might bring a bit of physicality to that Galway midfield. You know, Eva Dunhu and Neve Kilkenny, when they're there, are lovely hurlers, but they're that bit smaller, faster, and lighter. And I think Galway will need a bit of physicality there between, you know, Thompson and, and Looney and, uh, on Sunday. Yeah, because Rory, um, Thompson and Looney, they're. Um... They don't mess about, I suppose, is a fair way of putting it on. No, and they give they give Cork a great steal kind of right down the centre of their team. So you're going to have to try and get, on, like for Galway, if they have any chance, they're going to have to try and get on top there. But, you know, they're playing they're playing good hurling this year. As I said, I think Paddy Murray is extremely ambitious. They will definitely feel they've left, they the left one after them over the last couple of years. And I look, I think... I still think it's extremely hard to call. Um, and uh, as I said, hopefully or like hopefully they can get that red card rescinded from a card perspective. Uh, but <laughs> I think really from, he's, he's not even attempting <laughs> to be impartial here really today. I think from a hurling, I think I think from a hurling perspective, we're hoping that the red card uh, gets from rescinded. From a car hurling perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from a hurling perspective, we're hoping that it gets rescinded and uh, that we get the spectacle that we're we're expecting. And I do think actually, I mean, if you look at we'll say Cork Kenny matches, they generally Cork Kenny all Ireland finals. They've always been really, really tight and they've been really sort of, um, th- th- there's not been much in it. But I think that's by and large because both teams are really well versed and the sort of basics, the hook and block, and, and it's just very hard to find space, get scores off, get shots off. I think Cork Galway, again, it's all about styles. I think it tends to be a little bit more fluid, a little bit more open. And I'd expect this to be a really good game and a really good advert, actually, for women's hurling. Um, just looking at it, Elaine, the... Both 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 teams scored, you know, a reasonable number of goals in their group games, maybe two or three on average. You notice that kind of dries up then, don't you? Kind of the knockout stages. Their goals are, are hard to come by, as Roy just mentioned, obviously the defences are better. Um do you think this is the kind of game where you do have some particularly you know, kind of well matched teams? Could could goals be crucial? I know goals are always crucial, but do you think either team will actually go in with a game plan of like if we get two or three goals here? Will we like kind of be a little bit more ruthless when they get in kind of the scoring area? Yeah, I think probably two or three is probably a bit ambitious for many of them. But certainly, I think from a Cork point of view and from a Galway point of view, it won't have gone unnoticed that Tip did create, as I said, four or five goal chances in that second half of the semi final. And certainly, if I was Cork, I'd be looking at it and I was thinking, right, they were developed from good, long, fast runs from Clodagh McIntyre from around the middle of the field. And they'll be looking to the runs that Linda Collins made last weekend when she came on. Katrina Mackey, Amy O'Connor, they'll be looking to get those players on runs. Even Laura Hayes from wing back, Saoirse McCarthy with that point that she scored in the first half. That's the way Cork like to play. They like to run at you. They like to bring that speed to you. So I think Cork will certainly have targeted that and they'll have said, look, there's a weakness there maybe in that Galway defence that a bit of speed can exploit. Let's try and do it. And look, on the other side, then you have proven goal getters in Crow Park and Elish O'Reilly, Siobhan McGrath for Sarsfields inside in the full forward line. So certainly from a Galway point of view, they'll be looking to get them on the ball. Maybe didn't quite click as well as you would expect from both of those players the last day. So, you know, that can go one of two ways then coming into a final. They can explode and have the game of their lives. But from a Cork point of view, again, I suppose their defence was outstanding the last day. I thought they shut out every opportunity. Like Kilkenny had plenty of scoring opportunities, but they were forced wide. They were forced to drop them short. And that came from the pressure I think the Cork backs had on them. You know, and Cork are good to get their numbers back, but they transitioned so quickly then. And you know, Ursula spoke about Thompson and Looney in the middle of the field. But add on to that midfield duo, you put on the axis of Laura Hayes on one side, Saoirse McC- McCarthy on the other and then Chloe Sigerson sitting deep at the far side so the amount of play that went between Looney Thompson and um, Sigerson the last day was just phenomenal and obviously Chloe Sigerson then with her five points four from play from distance so from a Galway point of view I don't expect them to sit off Chloe Sigerson you can't afford to when she can pop points from 45 50 and 60 yards so I expect she's going to be tightly marked and if she's hanging out on the right hand side with someone closely marking her there's going to be a lot of space inside then for someone the likes of Linda Collins or Katrina Mackey maybe to run into that space or for Hannah Looney to make one of her lung busting runs from the middle of the field and to create that overlap that may just create a goal opportunity for Cork. Okay, well, um, I'm about to ask for predictions, so I might stick with you, Elaine, there because it sounds like you're very much swaying towards Cork. 
I just coming into the semi final, I suppose all the talk was maybe about Kilkenny. And as a Kilkenny person living in Cork, I was saying, no, lads, Cork are so quiet. I'm so suspicious of them when they're quiet. When Cork are quiet, they're plotting. And everyone was saying, no, you're living in Cork. You're only playing up the opposition. But I know from experience, Cork timed their runs so perfectly to get to Crow Park in September. So be it an All Ireland semi final or final, I think they're, they're, they timed them so well to get there and they performed there. Paddy Murray said it himself, Cork love travelling to Crow Park. They have no baggage coming to Crow Park. You know, he said he preferred to play semi-finals and finals there rather than in Nolan Park or Cork or anywhere else. So I think they're going to really relish the opportunity to get back to Crow Park again. Maybe don't carry as much baggage as Galway will. But going back to Crow Park, as Ursula said, they've been beaten there in the last two national finals that they were in. So even Sarah Durbin mentioned it during the week in an interview. I think that small little bit of baggage may be there from a Galway point of view. But look, obviously, Orla Cronin is going to be a huge swing vote in. If, if she's playing, it gives Cork an absolute ace in their pack. You know, they can afford then to stick or twist with Linda Collins. Do they start her or do they bring her on for an impact like they did the last day? But um, and look, from a Galway point of view, they're back in an All-Ireland. I think they feel they have unfinished business from December and again, probably from the league final in June. So they'll be looking to kick on again. Probably feel they haven't maybe clicked. If they click on Sunday, I really think they can probably push it on. But just for me, I think Cork are coming with a little bit of momentum, having beaten Kilkenny. Bit of a cause behind them now if they don't get over the crown and overturned. You know, every, every good team needs a little bit of a fight sometimes and, and a bit of a them against us mentality. And no better man to stir that up than Paddy Murray mm-hmm. in the Cork camp. So look for me, I think Cork may just shade it, but I expect it to go absolutely down to the wire. Okay. Ursula, how do you see it go? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the uh, Cork are going into this in a, in a great position. You know, they've they've got that kind of monkey off their back, you know, beating Kilkenny in the semi-finals. They lost the last two semi-finals to the eventual winners. So that's going to be a massive confidence boosting thing for, for this Cork team. For me, I just think Cork's experience and how they play in Crow Park will suit them on Sunday. Um, obviously, Orla Cronin is going to be a huge loss if she's not playing. But I actually think sometimes that rallies on the rest of the players in the, in the panel. So if she's not playing, I expect some of these other players you know, to stand up, whether it's Linda Collins, Amy O'Connor, whoever. Um, but for me, I think Cork's record in Crow Park, uh, their confidence going into this game. And I just think maybe they're playing that little bit more complete uh, performance in the last couple of games. I think that will stand to them. And also... Galway have beaten uh, Cork in the league semi-final. Galway beat Cork last year in the championship and Galway beat Cork in the Ireland semi-final two years ago. Cork learned from losses, I think, better than any other team. And I think that will stand to him. And Paddy Murray is a genius at getting his matchups right on the biggest stage. So that's why I'm probably just slightly tipping Cork. Okay, well, I- I'm also tipping Cork because as much as I love to go for the underdog, I just think that... Um... They just they, they they look very strong and as you said they uh they come good at the right time of the year. Rory I know is going to upset the apple cart here and predict the Galway win. <laughs> no, not no, not at all. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going in and bringing the smallies in. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to be going in with my with my cork jersey on and uh, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off for the day, so I'll be able to go in and just relax and enjoy it. I'm looking forward to a really good day's hurling and I and I, I just think they'll have. I think there's a there's enough. I saw enough resilience and spite in their game. In the Kil- in the Kilkenny semi final, just to give me the feeling that look, they're they're just on a mission this year. I think there's a really good feel good factor right across the board in car curling, despite what happened to the men. Um, but the uh, you know from minors all the ways up, and I think uh, and I and, and I'd be I'd be hopeful, uh, pretty, you know, I'd have a strong strong hope that the the women will do it on on Sunday. Well, look, we all have an interest on Sunday anyway, because for Ursula and myself, the Wexford Juniors are playing Armagh at noon, <laughs> and for Elaine, the Kilkenny Intermediate team are playing Antrim at two o'clock. So there's something for all of us. That's the important thing to say. Let's and hope that, we're oh, all happy Sunday. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and except we'll, all um, people. They're all live on RTE television, <laughs> and there'll be a commentary on uh, the senior match, and I would imagine a good bit of the intermediate match on RTE Radio Sunday Sport, and we'll have a live blog on the senior match of report and reaction on the RTE website. And all of that goes as well for Saturday, of course, with the All-Ireland Football Final at 5 o'clock. So we have you well covered, and we hope everybody enjoys the weekend. Uh, thank you again to Kieran and Desi earlier, and to Elaine, and to Ursula, and to Rory. And thank you very much for joining us, and we'll catch you next week, probably. I'd say we'll do an All-Ireland Final re- review. It would seem to make sure, sense. Why not? Why not? Possession we'll see you then. From this, how much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. 
we earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. What I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy Moses! 